Hello, this is David Hardman with the second screencast in the series Introduction to Cognitive Psychology, in which I'll be talking about the schools of functionalism and Gestalt psychology. William James is the person most associated with functionalism. James was a professor at Harvard University where he was very prolific and uh, amongst his uh, various works he wrote The Principles of Psychology and The Varieties of Religious Experience. Uh, the Principles of Psychology in particular is still very much quoted today in cognitive psychology textbooks because there James talks about many of the things that we still talk about such as uh, attention and consciousness. Um, on the topic of consciousness, James really um, took a different point of view to that of the structuralists who we heard about in the first screencasts. Uh, they talked about the idea that um, by looking at particular elements you could understand the structure of conscious perceptions rather as you build a jigsaw puzzle up in order to see a bigger picture. Uh, by contrast James noted that the contents of consciousness were continually changing. He talked about the stream of conscious experience. Um, so James was really interested in uh, uh, thinking or, or, or processes of mind in terms of a process or processes rather than uh, a kind of structure. The uh, functionalists generally uh, adopted various research methodologies which is another factor distinguishing them from the uh, structuralists uh, so they really thought that um, you know they, they, they adopted whatever methodology seemed appropriate for a particular question that was being asked uh, and the functionalists are also associated with what's called pragmatism uh, which is the idea that uh, truth um, or it's, a, it's an account of truth in which uh, people's thoughts and statements uh, should be verifiable in terms of what we can observe in uh, the world around us. And more than that, uh, it's the idea that knowledge should somehow be uh, useful, uh, that we should be able to apply our knowledge to uh, the world around us in beneficial ways. Uh, and one other thing that William James was very much associated with is a particular theory of emotion which um, uh, he independently came across um, with uh, Carl Langer. Um, so the James Langer theory of emotion says that um, our emotional experiences are basically uh, about perceiving our own physiological responses. Uh, and the example that's always used to illustrate this is uh, if I um, see a bear then I start running but my I, I don't run in response to my feelings of fear. Uh, rather it's the other way round. I see a bear, I run and then I experience the fear because uh, the, the fear is actually in an interpretation of my response to the bear. Um, so uh, this was really uh, influenced I think by uh, Charles Darwin's ideas about evolution. Certainly William James was interested in uh, Darwin's ideas about uh, evolution and this fits nicely with that in the sense that um, evolution has uh, uh, equipped us with uh, certain adaptive behaviours uh, and obviously running uh, in the face of danger uh, is, is one of those things. One of James's students was Edward Lee Thorndike who had a big influence on the subsequent school of behaviorism which we'll encounter in the next screencast. Um, Thorndike uh, was rather scornful of people who thought that animals showed insight when uh, trying to solve various problems and uh, Thorndike, by contrast, thought that animals exhibited behaviours that had somehow been rewarded or punished in the past and he developed the law of effect which says that uh, an organism is uh, 
more likely to repeat a behavior if that behavior has previously led to uh, a satisfying outcome uh, so the behavior is strengthened uh, or if a behavior is followed by unsatisfactory uh, outcomes then that behavior is weakened and is, is less likely to be repeated. There's a very nice uh, video reconstruction on YouTube uh, of uh, the kind of uh, study that Thorndike did. He uh, used cats in uh, uh, his studies. Um, it doesn't run very well in the screencast, so I'm not going to show it here, but uh, I'll make it available on my web pages for my students, uh, or you can look it up on YouTube by entering the terms Thorndike Law of Effects. And I'm going to finish by briefly looking at uh, the approach of the Gestalt psychologists. Um, again, rather in opposition to the structuralist approach, uh, the Gestalt approach can be summed up in the saying that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And the founders of Gestalt psychology are Max Wertheimer, Kurt Kofka, and Wolfgang Kohler. In particular, it's said that Wertheimer was the first really to actually uh, formally conceptualize the notion of Gestalt psychology and this happened when he was sitting on a train one day and observed that you could have the perception of motion even though you weren't actually moving and I'm sure this has happened to many of us you're on a train that's stationary and on the track next to you there's another train and as you look out the window you have the experience that your train is actually moving and it's only after a moment's reflection you suddenly realize that actually you're not moving it's the train next to you that's moving so Wertheimer apparently observed that uh, perception does not necessarily correspond with reality uh, the Gestalt psychologists had a big impact in the field of visual perception but also in the field of problem solving. Uh, Wolfgang Kohler um, was uh, carried out some studies with uh, an ape called Sultan who he observed on more than one occasion appeared to be solving problems in an insightful kind of fashion. But the example on the page here uh, on the left hand side uh, on the screen I should say um, with these various dots. It's an illustration of the Gestalt Law of Similarity, one of several principles uh, for um, organizing our, our visual perceptions. Uh, and the Law of Similarity says that we tend to group together things which appear to be similar. So here, rather than just seeing a whole bunch of uh, dots, what we actually see are several rows of white dots and several rows of black dots. So the, the things that are similar appear to be uh, grouped. So that's the basic idea behind the approach of Gestalt psychology and that's where I'm going to finish for the moment and in the next screencast we'll be looking at the School of Behaviorism. So I'll see you then.